you get the opportunity, um, please do have a look. So we are recording now, as, as I'm sure you all got the announcement. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get started um, out of respect for everybody's time here. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us today on the, for this really important discussion. Um, and before we get started, I, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Eliana Nosa, who um, came up with this idea, it put, did all of the work in terms of putting this panel together and, and, and organizing the structure of it. And um, it's an important and necessary thing. And I really want to thank her for everything she did to make this happen. Um, the way that this will go today, um, it's not, you know, it's not too rigid, but uh, at the beginning, um, we'll start with Joanna Rankin, who will give um, some opening remarks. And then each panelist will give an introduction and, and share a little bit about um, the, the role Adecibo played in their career and the, the impact um, of the loss of Adecibo on their careers. Um, and then I'll have a, a first question as a jumping off point um, for our panelists. And from there, um, we'll, we'll open it up. I hope that you know, this is very particip participatory, um, that everybody is engaging in the discussion um, and that, you know, that we can talk together um, about uh, the impact of the loss and, and what can we do going forward. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for agreeing to do this today. And with that, I will hand it to Joanna for opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. It's a pleasure to be here. And I certainly echo the, the thanks to um, Eliana for coming up with this idea. And, um, and the more I thought about it, um, it seems like um, something that, should, uh, that we should continue to think about and, um, and perhaps even be a theme. But what I want to do is just make a few brief remarks about where we are with regard to people uh, in, um, in, in, uh, with respect to telescopes and instruments. Um, scientific instruments, telescopes in particular, are largely about people. They're, worth, they're worthless without their builders, their designers, their funders, um, uh, the people that maintain them, the operators, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so communities develop around instruments with people in all of these roles. Working relationships and friendships are, are founded, which sometimes last a good part of a lifetime. Certainly they're the kinds of roles that, that, um, that uh, professional um, professions are built on, our professional work is built on. And because these roles are essential, they have to be replicated. And so some people have to teach other people how to do things. This is, this is obvious in the academia sense where uh, professors have mentors and professors have students. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the process of teaching, Often bonding happens with uh, between between teachers and students, and between students themselves. And so, again, this is a piece of the community that gets constructed. So, the collapse of a telescope becomes a social and economic problem, as well as a scientific obstacle uh, for its community. Jobs may be in jeopardy. Students can't be trained because, uh, because they don't have a context for doing their thesis work. And in such circumstances, these all important communities can fragment, dissipate, and even vanish. We have an example of this about what a good part of 30 years ago when the Green Bank 300 foot telescope collapsed in November of 1988. Joanna, you muted for a moment. Oh, my apologies. Okay, shall I just start over? <laughs> From the Green Bank collapse, if you would. 
Or did did it did it get muted somehow in the middle of my of my talking? Um, just when you began speaking about Green Bank, okay, um, it right. Muted. All right, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and my video also. Yeah, the video is off as well. These things are mysterious. <laughs> um, anyhow, so we have an example uh, in our in our radio astronomy community um, from. 1988, when the Green Bank 300 foot telescope collapsed. And it was a fully subscribed telescope doing work in, in many different parts of the radio astronomy community. And then a few years later, the Arecibo telescope in October of 1992 was out of commission for, oh, six or seven years uh, with the Gregorian upgrade. And so, this was a major problem for astronomers in the US. Um, beforehand, radio astronomy had been practiced in many US universities. Students were trained. Um, it was, it was a, a, a very regular part of, the, of astronomical activities. And in the 1990s, this, this activity wound down. PhDs couldn't be trained, programs were discontinued, people left radio astronomy. Much of the action shifted to Europe and in fact, India with the, with the, um, with the uh, GMRT. And, the and there were many broader effects uh, like limited training and employment for RF engineers and transmitter engineers. So after 2000, the radio astronomy community was rebuilt, but with difficulty, and much of it anew, rather than being exactly a, con a continuation of what was there until um, the 1990s. So, so let us try to learn from the past. Hardware is just hardware. It is the community of people with special expertise that makes science possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. That, that was a wonderful opening and a nice to have that broader historical context. So what, what I'd like to do now um, is uh, have each of our panelists give an introduction. Um, our panelists today are Ed Rivera-Valentin, Joanna Rankin, Patrick Taylor, Natalia Lewandowska, Brett Isham, Julia Deneva, and um, Myra LeBron may be joining us, but um, I think right now she's not able to. So we'll stay tuned for her. But on that note, I will ask each panelist, please to introduce yourself and um, hit on some of the points that we had discussed earlier about the importance of Arecibo to you. So Ed, would you mind starting? Sure. So do you see me now? Yes, there we go. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ed Rivera Valentin. I'm currently a planetary scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. I had the privilege and opportunity to join the Odyssey Will staff back in 2014 when Mike Nolan took a chance on hiring me. I did not come from a background in graduate school as someone who was studying radar or using radar science. I was using the outcomes and the interpretations from radar observations in my dissertation. So when I joined the Odyssey Will staff, it was actually my first experience getting to do science, do radar science. But it was also really important for me in that as someone who was born in Odyssey Will, Puerto Rico, as someone from the city, getting to work at the place that fundamentally inspired me to go into science was just super awesome. Um, so try not to cry, sorry. Uh, so the importance of Odyssey for my science. So in, I mean, it's obvious the importance of radar for up for planetary defense, right? In looking at asteroids, I was, focusing a bit more on non-small body objects like Mercury um, and Mars. And in fact, I was going to have the opportunity to observe Mars for the first time in quite a while. That would have been the best imagery that we would have gotten for again, quite a while. And it wouldn't occur again until like 2050 in September of uh, 2020 when 
right after the the first cable collapse. So we lost the opportunity, uh, a golden opportunity to observe Mars. Um, in terms of studying these objects, I think a good analogy here is when you are looking at Mercury, um, one hour's worth of data from Arecibo is equivalent to five hours of bi-static observations from the Goldstone Solar System Radar to GBT. And I would get two and a half hours worth of that data in a day, seven days. And that data has allowed me to look at what is the type of radar scattering we're seeing in the places that we have for sure identified ice and the PSRs and being able to test various radar scattering models over these areas then allow us to actually go back and improve our interpretations of lunar PSRs. And if we care about this whole returning to the moon and having in situ resources that we can use, we need to improve our ability to identify what is the radar signature of ice versus still thing just very rough. And Mercury was a great test bed for that. With the loss of Adesivo, we've lost a significant portion of that ability. I was restarting an observing campaign in 2019, so I got at least two years worth of data, but that's it. Um, the other question you had here was how long it took for me to learn how to see well. I joined Azul in 2014 having not used radar, so it took me quite a while. Um, I went definitely from learning it as a black magic box of sitting what is sitting down in front of the telescope and just trying to memorize what the magical incantations are to actually do radar. And then along the way, learning what those incantations meant and all of the extra science that you could do. So it definitely took me those two years-ish or so to be something close to proficient, I would say. Uh, these definitely radar is something that we're not used to it's not something that one is used to thinking in, or it doesn't give you data in a way that you are used to thinking about it, but it's also something that in our education system is not something that people are largely introduced to. Um, I have surveyed several universities who offer planetary science degrees and some of them offer remote sensing classes and some of those classes have at least a day or so worth of looking at what radar gets you. Um, so really in the current scheme of universities and planetary science PhDs, we're significantly lacking um, bringing in people into radar science. And then the last question you had here was the importance and uniqueness of my research and with Adesivo. So I went over at least the impact of getting to lose out on Mercury. Um, I also mentioned we've, we've now lost the capability of observing Venus and radar. But I really wanna to touch base on something very important that Joanna mentioned, which is the societal science impact. So at AO, I had another privilege of getting to co-manage the Odyssey Observatory Space Academy, where we brought high school students from Puerto Rico to actually work with us. We, several of those students actually stayed with us and observed with us uh, asteroids. They took their data. They got to analyze their data. They got to present their data at the University of Puerto Rico. We were bridging those gaps. And in a field where like 1% to 2% of my field is actually Hispanic, actually being able to work with people in PR, showing them the awesomeness that is this field. I mean, that is how you bridge some of those opportunity gaps for people. And in terms of PR, we've lost that. And one of the things that was very, I guess, awakening and touching for me personally was uh, in the wake of the loss of Ida Sewell, several students from EOSA and others who are currently uh, at the University of Puerto Rico, when they were interviewed by the press, they all said that one of the losses that they're having is they wanted to go off, get a PhD in astronomy or planetary, and then come back and work in PR to be close to their families. And that's lost for them. Um, they won't get that opportunity. And that's not just their loss of opportunity. Think about all of that potential science they would have been able to do for us and for the world. So that to me is one of the most powerful losses. Thank you so much, Ed, for that and for sharing that. And, and your last point is especially well taken. That is 
a huge loss in all of this uh, that we, we shouldn't forget as we're going forward. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask now, Joanna, if you would mind coming back on and, and giving just a little more introduction to yourself and the personal um, impact to you. Well, I want to um, just say that Arecibo has been the great privilege of my life to use. It's made so much of my science possible. It was the magnificent accident that I was able to go to Puerto Rico uh, and in the very late 60s. I was there about, about five years, maybe six years after the telescope came into operation. I mean, to use Ed's word magical, um, the grandeur of the instrument, I think has inspired me all my life and it inspired every single student who I ever had the privilege of going there to work with. Um, uh, so, um, so it's a huge loss. And um, I mean, it's, a, it's perhaps less of a loss for me because I'm, I'm just retired and at the end of my career, but, but uh, it's, so it's much more of a loss for younger people. But nonetheless, it's a, uh, it's a huge loss. It's a stunning loss. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, next, if, uh, if you are able, Patrick Taylor, if you can give us an introduction to yourself and hit on some of the points discussed. First, I think Ed said most of everything that I would want to say on the subject. Um, for my personal story, I was started as a grad student at Cornell in 2003, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. You know, I, I liked solar system things. I liked dynamics and stuff like that. Uh, but I certainly wasn't really an observer by any means. And it just so happened that in the middle of my first year, Cornell hired Jean-Luc Margot. And he introduced me to radar astronomy. It's something I had never considered. I don't know if I had even heard of it at that point. But by that summer, my bags were packed and I was shipped off to Arecibo, like many Cornell grad students at that <laughs> over those years. And yeah, it's been my life ever since. I, I was there many times as a grad student. I was then a postdoc, I was a staff scientist, I was a group lead. Um, even when I left Arecibo a few years ago, I was still heavily, heavily, heavily involved in the planetary radar program. So that's why I wrote that sentence that we watched our, our careers crash down. It, it's the only thing I ever knew and now it's gone. Um, so yeah, in terms of uniqueness uh, for planetary radar, there's only two places in the world you could do this, Arecibo and Goldstone, and now one of them's gone. So that makes it, it difficult. I had mentioned the, the difference in sensitivity, which of course limits the sorts of things we can do now scientifically. I mean, I really haven't observed since Arecibo's, uh, the issues at Arecibo. Um, of course, I still get to work on radar, but I'm not, I'm not an observer anymore at this point, which is a, a big difference. Um, so yeah, even after more than 15 years of, of working with Arecibo, I, I'm still not an expert. I, I, in terms of getting the most out of Arecibo, I still don't think I, I ever made it that far. So there's, there's a difference between proficiency and uh, expertness, <laughs> or whatever the proper word is. Um, so yeah, I, I think I can just echo a lot of what Ed said, you know, we've lost a, a very sensitive and capable instrument and it's going to be very hard to replace 
especially on a short-term basis. Um, yeah, I think that, that pretty much covers it for me, I think. Thank you, Patrick, very much. I appreciate that. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to ask Natalia if she would give her introduction. Yeah, can, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, hello everyone. I'm Natalia Lewandowska. I'm currently a visit, visiting assistant professor of physics at Swarthmore College. And I met Joanna many years ago at a conference in my home country in Poland in 2012. And the first thing that we started to discuss was Arecibo. So this was kind of like um, my first kind of like introduction into the this facility as a professional instrument. But I'm uh, going uh, too, too far ahead of myself. So let me uh, switch back a little bit. So I'm originally from Poland and from Germany. So I came to the US as a postdoc. Um, but as a grad student, I managed to go to Arecibo for the 2013 Single Dish Summer School. And this was a very important event for me. I remember I asked my advisor back then and he said, no, he was kind of like yelling at me saying, uh, we don't have money for that because it would mean a uh, flight overseas. And so I just, um, I remember turning to him and saying, what if I come up with the money myself? And he said, then you can go. And I said, okay, so I will do that. And I would, I kind of applied to several um, astronomical societies, and they were so kind to give me the money for the flight, so I could I could go, which was great. But um, when I when I arrived there, I was just completely overwhelmed because it was so beautiful. I had never seen such a facility like that, um, and I wanted to learn everything that I could in the one week that I was there. Uh, the week turned out to be great and I think I met Julia for the very first time. Julia will be speaking a little bit later and she showed me how to move the telescope and not only me but a group of students where I was also included and this was really this kind of like made my day when I when I saw everything moving and those people who who know me I I'm deeply in love with all kinds of radio telescopes so um when I was a postdoc at the Greenback Observatory uh, for two years, I was asked at the end of my time there, what was the best moment for me? And I, I told HR back then the best moment for me was to move the Greenback telescope and to see how it's moving and to observe with it. So anyways, um, Arecibo, I think I should also focus on how much Arecibo means uh, for me also professionally. So. I'm studying very little or tiny stars called uh, pulsars out there. And the emission that we detect from them is, is very weak. So we need like uh, big radio telescopes. Um, and Arecibo was very special for me because uh, the kind of research that I'm doing is very unconventional. It kind of like focuses on irregular radio emission from, from these stars. And with Arecibo, I I carried out a survey of some pulsars that showed this emission in 2017. And I got data out of that that was so good, like nothing from any other radio telescope that I saw, Green Bank included. So long story short, I got so many single pulses that I did not even know where to start <laughs> with the analysis. Um, so from a professional point of view, Arecibo, the collapse of Arecibo has basically cut off this project. Um, I also planned to include several of my students in. And my big ideas for the future were in the past also to somehow uh, get the money together and go with my students to Arecibo, same as Joanna did with her students in the past. Um, but this will not happen anymore at the moment. I mean, I still have the data that I have and I'm working on it. Um, but I think the meaning of Arecibo uh, is so deeply embedded in me because the first time I heard about this facility ever was when I read Carl Sagan's book, Contact. There, Arecibo is mentioned. And um, 
I kind of like collected all of the names. I was 10 years old when I read the book for the first time. I did not understand a thing from physics, which was kind of like normal. Um, but I read about these gigantic radio telescopes. And then when the internet came along, I, I looked all of them up. And I remember I was always wondering why, why does a receiver have such a unique different structure than the other radio telescopes, which look like parabolic antennas pretty much that you see also on the roofs in smaller shape uh, form. And when I came to um, Arecibo for this workshop in 2013, I kind of like pestered the people over there that many times with that many questions until I finally understood how it was working. So uh, then I had the idea, okay, maybe I can go there for a, for a postdoc if, it, if there will be a position uh, open. So I know I'm taking too much time away, so sorry about this, but um, what I want to say without crying, hopefully, is that Arecibo has a very deep personal meaning for me. It, for me as a student, it was like the dream coming true to be able to, to go there and to see it with my own eyes and to get the great privilege of observing with it. And I'm when, when it collapsed, uh, my students asked me a day later, have you heard about the telescope that collapsed? And I said, yeah, but I needed to swallow uh, the kind of like tears away. Because for me, it was, not, as well, it was not just the telescope that collapsed. It was kind of like my telescope that uh, I always wanted you know, to, to work with as long as I could that just collapsed. So it has a very deep personal meaning for me. And now when my current students are kind of like start a sentence with that, oh, do you know the telescope that collapsed? I say, it is not only the telescope that collapsed, it is the Arecibo radio telescope. And we are working on getting a new one. It will just take time. So thank you. Thank you, Natalia. I think the point that it's it's not just a telescope is a, a very, very good one. Um, and with that, I would like, uh, if Brett is willing, Brett, can you give an introduction? Yes, thanks. So um, I second that Contact is a great movie and uh, a really good um, advertising for Arecibo also. And uh, um, I also, uh, I should mention, I also like the, the day after tomorrow as focusing on atmospheric science. <laughs> I like that one. It's, uh, I thought it had great de depictions of the scientists. But when I was young, though, at that time, uh, I watched Planet of the Apes and 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I'm not quite uh, at the point of Joanna, but I have been thinking, uh, getting a little closer to retirement, but not quite. So I've always been interested in astronomy and space. Uh, I stumbled across Arecibo in graduate school, and I was a summer student at Arecibo when graduate students were also summer students. Um, it, Arecibo science uh, fit into all of my interests in science and engineering. And uh, I did, I worked for, uh, uh, my advisor was Tor Hagvers, who was the director of Arecibo at the time. So I did my PhD at Arecibo and also a bit at ISCAT, uh, which is, was another interest of Tor since he was a former ISCAT director also. <laughs> and then I, I did a postdoc in Sweden working with ISCAT and then uh, following that uh, postdoc at Arecibo, both uh, focusing on heating experiments and uh, Langmuir wave physics. Uh, then I, I worked for four years at ISCAT in, in starting in 2000 in Tromso and uh, Longyearbyen and Svalbard. So then decided to return to Puerto Rico. And so since 2004, I've been uh, a faculty member at Inter-American University in Puerto Rico. So uh, I, my wife has a house in Arecibo and I usually ride my bike up to the observatory when I want to go there, but I haven't done that uh, officially, at least since the pandemic. Uh, although I have uh, gone up and hiked around the back and took a sneak peek uh, to see how the place has been doing since the, during the problems with the cables and the collapse. And it's been, you know, pretty sad. Uh, so uh, 
I have a variety of projects uh, in science and instrumentation related to Puerto Rico, related to Arecibo, as well as some other observatories such as ISCAT and HARP. In the last few years, I've uh, steered more towards instrumentation, uh, working on developing uh, HF, uh, an HF imaging capability and uh, HF radars in, for Puerto Rico and uh, mostly in Puerto Rico, but also with the possibility of taking instrumentation to other places. But the, uh, the advantage of having Arecibo in Puerto Rico, uh, it was a big uh, plus for those projects, both, both in science and engineering, because techniques I could use Arecibo for uh, collaborative measurements with the, with the, of course, the heating facility, also the incoherent scatter radar. Um, and uh, that would that's an advantage not only in Puerto Rico but also for when uh, those techniques are developed using them at other places. Um, so uh, I think it's it's both been more difficult. It has disrupted some of the justifications for my projects. I, I'm hope I've been trying to support the quick. Re, uh, rebuilding of the HF facility, which seems like it might be possible in the next couple of years, and that would be a big plus. Um, just recently, I was at the uh, Air Force Research Lab in Albuquerque, trying uh, exploring the possibility of, of getting the former Ramey Solar Observatory site, which is in Aguadilla, as a place to put instrumentation, for the, uh, in particular the HF antennas that I'd like to use for imaging both radio emissions and uh, radar HF radar scatter from the ionosphere. So those guys uh, basically said it's more difficult to get the justification without having the HF facility and the incoherent scatter radar. So that's one difficulty I've been having with projects. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. And I, I, uh, uh, the other way around, I think having that, if we can get that site, I think it could be a plus for re helping to restore the observatory. So, um, and uh, just in general in the field, the HF and the ISR at mid-latitude is a, a unique combination. There is HARP in Alaska and ISCAT still has a heating facility. Uh, and I guess they will continue with that. They're both at high latitudes. So, and it's, it's quite different. Also the, the very uh, sensitive, capable, a large dish allowed incoherent scatter measurements, which are just not possible at ISCAT. So um, it would be great to be able to restore those capabilities and uh, move forward with uh, getting an even better uh, observatory in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Brett. And yeah, I hope that we can continue discussing why Arecibo is unique and what we can do to make it um, stand out and special and um, and give it the best chance for its rebuild. Um, so our last panelist who I would ask to do an introduction um, is Julia. Julia, can you come on and introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Julia Deneva. I apologize for a lack of video, but I tried to turn it on earlier and my Ubuntu laptop crashed, so I will just speak with voice. Um, I'm from Bulgaria originally, and Arecibo was my moonshot. I found out about its existence after seeing the movie Contact when I was in high school, which was in the 90s, in the aftermath of the fall of the Iron, Iron Curtain, when Bulgaria was plunged into economic and political chaos. So it really, I dreamed about it the way a kid would dream to be an astronaut, not really believing that I would ever get to see it in my own eyes. But several years later, I got a one in a once a lifetime opportunity to study in the US. And it so happened that I was a summer student at Arecibo while I was in college, which was again, a, an ex an exception that the observatory made for me because I was an international student and I could not apply to the RU program. So I, when I found out they had that program, I emailed, I basically spammed the entire staff of the observatory <laughs> asking what, what could I do to be able to work there. And it turns out that 
they do take international students who can find their own funding. So my advisor in college made that happen. <laughs> and I first got there in the summer of 2002, absolutely awed and not really believing my eyes when I saw it for the first time. And since then, I have been back there in several capacities. Basically, the, that first experience of going to a civil determined which grad school I would go to and what field I would enter because I was a summer student of Paolo Freire, who was the pulsar astronomer at the RCB at the time. And I had never heard about pulsars before, but it was the most fascinating and outlandish and extra extraordinary <laughs> field of astronomy that I had learned about at the time. So I decided to go to graduate school at Cornell since Cornell at the time was managing a receivable. And I decided to, even before I got to grad school and you will be studying pulsars. And in grad school, Cornell had a pre-doctoral program where you could be resident at the receivable after you had completed all of your co coursework and done your uh, qualifying and candidacy exams. So I spent the last few years of my PhD is splitting the year between Ithaca, where Cornell is, and Arecibo. And actually, Patrick Taylor and I are the same crop of Cornell grad students who later became um, postdocs at Arecibo. So after doing the doctoral program, immediately after graduation, I moved to Arecibo to be a postdoc and have been going, using it for my research ever since and until the collapse. At the time of the collapse, um, I was the PI of the largest Pulsar survey with our CBO since 2010, uh, which was a drift survey at 327 megahertz that aimed to cover the entire portion of sky visible from our CBO, which no one had done before. And at the time that the collapse happened, I had, a, I had just got a collaborative grant with Maura McLaughlin at West Virginia University to complete the survey. The grant period began on September 1st, 2020, and the collapse happened on December 1st, 2020. So we have um, a couple of graduate students and a bunch of undergrads who were included in the proposal for the next three years with the plan, with the goal of them being involved with this large survey and all the data processing and we have to we have had to radically reorganize what we do and submit an updated work plan to the nsf and basically we will not be able to complete this survey in the manner that we uh, planned because now we have a patchwork of data from two different spectrometers instead of being able to cover the entire civil sky as we had planned with the same mo most most recent and newest and most sensitive instrument that the Arecibo had. So that is one thing. Um, another thing that I found, so currently I work at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC. And because it is a Navy facility and, and a secure facility, they educate us every year about uh, various type of security procedures. And I have come to appreciate the issues of national security that tie into radio astronomy. So for example, um, those who were in the Zoom calls that we, ha we have had while we're waiting for the cable repair know that there was some expressed interest from Department of Defense in maybe taking over um, receivable management at the time or the repair. Space Force at some point seemed like was going to get involved. And a receivable has been used by DOD in the past. But another issue is uh, that right now, certain fields, including uh, people like me and groups, pulsar groups who do uh, pulsar searching and timing, we literally have objects that are not, cannot be studied anywhere except with the fast telescope in China because they're just too weak. So what we did, what the, our survey team did, of course, we submitted a fast proposal, but we found out that um, in order to be allowed to observe even after the proposal was accepted, the PI of the proposal had to submit a lot of personal information, including like a, a, a picture of their passport and all sorts of things that you would normally only submit to a government if you're entering the country. 
and we were not even going there. So we're basically a captive audience and we are paying for observing time without personal information. And there was a big discussion in the Pulsar community because we were not the only ones in the there were other people about what to do and how to handle this. We requested exceptions, explanations, and in, in the end, we had to comply because otherwise we just could not do our science, they would not let us. So that is another um, potential security issues. So for example, working at the Navy facility, I have not asked, but I'm fairly certain I would not be allowed to do this, which means I cannot be a PI on a fast proposal. So that is one thing. And our uh, current PI is a graduate student at West Virginia University who's basically had no choice but to submit his personal information to be able to complete this research. Uh, as to how long it took to learn to use the receiver to its full potential, I would say that I didn't really get to see the nitty gritty until I became a staff member there because then I was involved in commissioning the new spectrometer called Puppy, which was um, commissioned in 2013 and 2014. And along with Phil and Paolo Freire, we deliberately broke things. We deliberately pushed the instrument to see how that would affect the data taking. And at the time I was also writing software for the data processing because when something goes wrong, we have to be able to, count, to handle all sorts of pathological cases. So that is something that you don't get to see if you're just an observer, you don't get to push the limits of what the hardware and software can do. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all for now. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you all, all of the panelists for those really wonderful and, and personal introductions. Um, so what I would like us to do now, if possible, so I will have, for those panelists who are able to, um, I would like to ask each of you to give, in, in 30 seconds, tell us why should we rebuild Arecibo Observatory? Um, and from that point, then we will, we will um, open up the discussion. So please, um, everybody who's in attendance, if you can type questions in the chat or we, you're also welcome um, when we get through the, tell us why we should rebuild in 30 seconds, you're welcome to unmute and just ask your question. But if you prefer to type it in the chat, that's also fine. Um, so what I'll do, um, maybe I'll, I'll go in reverse order. If Julie, you don't mind talking again in 30 seconds, um, can you tell us why we need to rebuild AO? Uh, for two reasons, because the US has held historically a dominant place in astronomy and it is improvident to relinquish that with one blow it will be a huge loss to US astronomy and to international collaborations involving the US. The second arm of reason why I already mentioned that is national security, mm -hmm. because for as long as uh, Western scientists are essentially forced to trade personal information and personal information with the Chinese totalitarian government, in exchange for time on fast telescope, that is not a good situation to be in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Brett, can I hand it over to you in 30 seconds? Why should we, why do we need to rebuild AO? Yeah, the, uh, I would agree that some uh, additional capability besides in China would be good uh, just for, for many reasons. The huge sensitivity of Arecibo also uh, applied to radar, not just radio. It's, so it's it's unique for for many uses, and uh, uh, both in radio and radar. Mm -hmm. And the the combination with uh, the heating facility is unique within in that it's in mid latitudes, which makes is a different type of ionosphere than in the polar regions or the equator. And the especially combined with the huge sensitivity of the incoherent scatter radar. So that's that's good. Thank you, Brett. That's excellent. Um, Natalia. 
Yeah, so uh, for, from the research point of view, I think Arecibo has many subtopics and the POSA research field. For me personally, interesting would be to find out, of course, what makes a pulsar tick and if there are any extra galactic ones in different galaxies. And for this uh, kind of uh, research, I mean, Arecibo is just superb. Uh, I mean, it's unprecedented in sensitivity. Um, from, I kind of like have the tendency to also think first about others, what it means to them. And I'm particularly thinking about um, the students uh, in Puerto Rico who currently have not the possibility to use such a fabulous facility for their own kinds of scientific questions. And believe me, these kids, whatever age they have, they are very smart um, and they have their own ideas um, about research. So I think it should be rebuilt, definitely rebuilt uh, to give us as a scientific community, and I'm not talking about the radio scientists here, but pretty much about all of the disciplines to give us the opportunity to, to answer all of the questions from our individual research fields that we have. And most importantly, to help also educate the, the new generations of scientists and give them what we had when we were in, well, in that part of our careers. Thank you, Natalia. Joanna. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think Arecibo uh, should be rebuilt because of its ability to inspire. Um, uh, societies need inspiration. We get inspiration from art and music and, and, and other sources. Um, but science is one of them, and um, and science and astronomy and other parts of of, of, of science, um, whatever else Arecibo was, it was a beacon of inspiration, and not just for astronomers, uh, but that beacon of inspiration certainly extended throughout Puerto Rico and really throughout the entire world. Very well said. Thank you, Joanna. Um, any final comments from any of the panelists on why we need to rebuild AO? Otherwise, what, I, what I'd like to do now is open it up to the, the everybody, please, if you have a question um, that you would like to ask any of our panelists, um, please do so now. Otherwise, we have a few talking points. Um, and I, I see Tapashi's question in the chat, if I may read that out. Um, given that NGVLA is very likely to happen and might have radar built in, would anybody like to comment on the time gap between now and when NGVLA will be available? Any panelists? Natalia. I mean, NGVLA is supposed to be constructed like what 2030 so this is the this is kind of like nine years from now on so think about how many generations of students will move through uh, universities within these nine years so i don't i don't really think that's soon enough even if you know radar people could could use the ngvla because even when they start building it it will take time to get to to get it built and it will take even more time to debug it as that's always the case with telescopes especially with new facilities so um i don't think this is a solution for our various generations of students who will specialize in various fields that include radio telescopes including engineering Thank you. And Sean asks um, in the chat, it will, can somebody confirm that NGVLA will have radar? Um, he, he mentions that he thought NRA, NRAO considered that, but it's not currently part of their plan. Does anybody know? I'll read the, uh, the chat if everyone's still okay with that. If it's not beyond the, the hem of this meeting, what has been the effect uh, on the staff? Uh, yes, definitely. We're going we're gonna to get to that in a moment. Thank you. Um, anybody know the answer to the radar question?
Okay. Um, so why don't, why don't we move on then to, to Garrett's question? Um, what's been the effect on the staff of Puerto Ricans in telescope operation, electronics, and so on? Can somebody comment on that from our panel? Or it, just in the audience. I know there are people in the audience who know that answer as well. Perhaps the answer is that we could address that question in a different panel. And thank you, Gareth, for suggesting that. That's a good point. Thank you, Eliana. OK. All right. So we'll, we'll hold that one um, and come back to that. Um, Jonathan writes, rebuilding would be a significant DEI action on the part of the scientific community. Can any of you think of anything else we are doing that compares to the effect of rebuilding at a CBO? So Jonathan, can you unmute? Um, are you able to elaborate a little bit on, on your question here? There, no doubt um, the, the educational aspect and the, the promotion of scientific careers of, um, you know, it was enormous, it is enormous from Arecibo. Um, are, are you asking, is there something currently comparable um, or... Can you yeah, elaborate? Well, I mean, I guess this relates to some of the stuff Ed was talking about mm -hmm. um, that in terms of access for the for the Hispanic population in Puerto Rico um, to science. Um, it just seems like a huge effect um, and a huge loss. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head that the scientific community is doing the compares. Everything else is little DEI statements. And I mean, they're, they're actually more substantive than that, um, trying to bring that issue into uh, proposal um, uh, review and things like that. Um, but I don't know, this, this just seems really significant. And I guess I'd like people to think in those terms. Um, I have to admit, it's kind of a rhetorical question. It's a great one, though, and it's you know one of the most important aspects and um, and one of the biggest impacts I think of Arecibo um, on the world. Um, and I and I'm going to take this opportunity to interject that please, if you can, join us at the AAS meeting um, in Salt Lake City. There will be some projection of of some of the sessions, but we, there are two special sessions that are focused on Arecibo and the, the um, DEI and, and it really education and outreach impact that it's had um, both in the REU sense and broader um, on the, uh, you know, the programs on the island with high school students, et cetera. So please uh, stay tuned for discussions on that at the AAS. And I'll, also I'll advertise that Hector Arce who is here is giving a plenary um, and that will be broadcast and, and it will focus on all of these issues, the impact of the loss of Arecibo, including the education and outreach um, aspect. With that, uh, the panelists, do you have comments on this? Natalia, please. Um, I was thinking like in the last couple of minutes uh, about what uh, Julia mentioned with past because I was in the very same position. I needed to submit my, my passport a uh, copy of my passport and stuff. And I don't know, I think by definition, um, you always need cross checks, especially of new discoveries. And the best way to cross check something is to reobserve it with a completely different facility to, to check whether you, you detect the same. Um, with the collapse of Arecibo, we don't have that possibility at the moment anymore. And I see this like as a as a huge drawback to you know our scientific thinking because no telescope is um, without flaws in the end. I mean, I worked at Green Bank, same as Julia worked at Arecibo. I saw stuff breaking. I broke stuff also on purpose. This was part of my job, um, and it's very complex um, a telescope. Um, and one only sees that when you're working either on the engineering or software part or kind of like when you are a, a staff member, same as she said. Um, so I think 
we also need another Arecibo radio telescope. So we actually have like several possibilities to answer our questions about our specific research fields and don't, you know, compete uh, for only one facility. Thank you. Thank you. Great point. Other comments from panelists on that? In our last few minutes, can, can anyone comment on um, specific projects that were active or really also training of your students? I know some of you, you in your introductions hit on this, but um, you know, places where you, the training of your students or your, your research projects were really derailed by the collapse and how, how you uh, dealt with that and um, what, is, what is the plan going forward? Yes, Julia, please. Yeah, so I am already mentioned that we had this large NSF grant that began right before the collapse. And that was uh, both to continue the survey and also to study our new discoveries. We have about, out, we have discovered so far almost 100 new pulsars and radio rotating radio transients. And about third of them we have not yet characterized, some of which are too weak for any other telescope but fast. So those which are not too weak for other telescopes, we are now observing at the giant meter wave radio telescope in India. And that has gone pretty well. Okay. Um, we're also planning to submit maybe to uh, Effelsberg or Lofar in the future. But we, we kind of see these proposals as a stopgap measure until... Yeah a similar telescope is uh, rebuilt or newly built in, in the Western hemisphere. And wherever, whenever that happens, I know that a pulsar survey will be one of, the, one of the large projects that will be on the agenda because every observatory does this and many, many new discoveries come out of each such survey. One issue that is specific to pulsars is that the most interesting ones are those in binary systems with other dense stars mm -hmm. and the most interesting of those are the systems where the orbital periods are very short when you're a few hours or less because there you can observe for relativistic effects that you don't get to see anywhere else and you get to measure uh, the pulsar masses which you can't measure otherwise and study uh, the equation of state of neutron star matter however Pulsar search algorithms rely on the pulses being fairly, fairly regular. And in binary systems, the observed period between pulses changes because of Doppler shifts due to orbital motion. So in those cases, just increasing the integration time actually makes things worse because you, you start overlapping a significant part of the orbit and you get aliasing and that derails our fast Fourier transform-based search algorithms. So we not only need an instrument that is sensitive enough to detect these objects, we need it to be sensitive enough to detect them in a relatively short amount of time so that we have a chance of discovering them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Julia. I wanna read a couple of comments from, from Dale in the chat. Um, he writes, it needs to be rebuilt so the science will have a place to live. If your house were destroyed by a hurricane, would you live in a hut until a new house was built? No, you'd repair the damage so you'd have a preferred place to live. Science has to have a place to live too. And Arecibo is indeed a, a great home for science. Um, a, new, a whole new area of science, properties of arcs on satellites was destroyed in the Arecibo collapse. No smaller telescope can see satellite arcs at the distance of the moon. Thank you, Dale. Um, so Tapashi has a question um, about education. Uh, is there any project now in your area of work involving Puerto Rican high school kids, even remotely, uh, to Ed? Um, so Ed, I'll let you answer that. Sure, thanks Tapashi. So uh, <clears throat> Desiree Coto Figueroa at the University of Puerto Rico, Macau is a co-I on one of the NASA missions. Um, through that, she has been able to develop a collaboration where it's uh, in a sense, a virtual research program for high school students so they can see how missions are developed and the type of science that then goes along with it. 
Uh, she has invited several people to give public talks. I mean, Mendez has several programs reaching out to local students. The LPI also does a high school research program that's also virtual where people get to work with uh, images from the moon um, and do their studies through that. So there, there are some continuing planetary science high school programs that are impacting PR. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, we're, we're a little bit over time now, but I, I hate closing off the discussion. I would like to, to convey a couple of more things um, from the chat um, and, and we'll wrap up. And certainly I think it's clear that we need to continue this conversation. I wanna read, Abel said, I was training undergraduate students on using the observatory. One is now in Harvard starting a PhD in astronomy. Other two are working on archive data. So that, that's amazing and, and speaks to uh, the impact that Arecibo has had on the education and, and launching careers of students. Um, there's an anonymous comment that I would like to read. Um, very hard for this person and going to the site doesn't get easier. The instrument is not there. Yes, we have much, much data, but that is all that's left. Data, logbooks, forgotten notes and cabinets, notes from lessons learned, it's heartbreaking. So thank you for, for sharing that to that person. Um, so uh, Tracy offers a link to the AO Star Academy program. Lots of education things continuing. Like I said, let's, you know, that, that was a huge um, capability loss when we lost Arecibo. And that's something that we need to think about. I hope, um, let me actually, let me read Chris's question real quick, quickly. Um, I stress that Legacy Telescope was not obsolete when it fell. It was still doing unique science. It needs to be rebuilt quickly, as cheaply as possible, and as good or better than before. FAST does not fill the whole role of even the legacy telescope. And that is an excellent, excellent point. Thank you, Chris. And I hope um, that as we look at the decadal results that are coming out today, for, for those of you who missed um, earlier, we put in the chat the link to the decadal survey. I'll put it there again. Arecibo is mentioned um, in one section, 5.15, so please have a look. Um, but let's think what, you know, what can we make, what can we do to make this happen on a, on a time scale that's, that's quick and right and needed. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us today and participated in this. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking your time and your energy to be here and to share your personal stories and your personal connection. Thank you again to Eliana for making this all happen and doing all the, the work behind this. Um, and um, please let's continue this conversation and uh, we can, we're all, you know, if you're not part of ASAP, join and we can talk through through ASAP um, and other ways. And let's keep moving forward. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. See you all later. See you. Thank you. Thank you.